And as you take your seats, take your Bibles, please, and open the Word of God to Song of Solomon, the song which is Solomon's, and the second chapter. I said this morning that God willing will finish Philemon, but the chances of finishing Song of Solomon are very, very unlikely for me over the next couple of weeks to get through chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Um, not, not likely at all, so uh, we won't even attempt. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, but at the very least, we'll finish chapter 2, and I, I, I'm really, really wanting to preach the opening verses of chapter 3 as well. So I would imagine next week, God willing, we'll just continue on into the third chapter. But uh, yes, we'll not be able to finish it, but the Lord knows. And I trust He'll bless what is preached and what has been preached. We're going to commence reading of verse 8, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 8. Let us give attention to the infallible Word of God, and may the Lord open up His Word to us this evening. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind her wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear in the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies, until the day break, and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Beether. Amen. We'll end the reading there at the end of the chapter, and I encourage you to bow your head and your heart before the Lord once again. Let us all still our hearts and seek the face of God. Lord, we would be fools to think that by nature we can fully comprehend Thy Word. No matter how much study we give to it, we are absolutely dependent upon the illumination of the Spirit of God upon our hearts and minds. Lord, give us that illuminating power. May that influence be upon us. May it please Thee to send Thy Spirit on this gathering and take the Word of God and mightily, mightily give light to Thy truth. We pray that as it is read and proclaimed, that there would be that sense of unusual heaven-sent power, and that the Spirit of God will take the utterances of men and use what is Thy Word to bring life into the hearts of the dead, to quicken, O oh God, those that need to experience the new birth, and deal with one and all. Help me, Lord. Fill me with Thy Spirit and come down upon this congregation. Work, glorify Christ, for we pray in His name. Amen. For those of you that have been Christians for any period of time, you will know the struggle of seeking to maintain your walk with God. That it's not easy to keep walking in the way 
that you ought to walk. If I was to ask any of you to testify of difficult times in your Christian life, you could do it. You could come and say, between this time and that time, I wasn't doing so well. I was struggling. And for most, maybe not all, but for most, the reasons for that struggle would be very similar. You would find that the vast majority would be giving up prayer, not really seeking the Lord. The vast majority would not be reading the Word, not meditating in His Scriptures and considering them regularly. And perhaps even some neglecting the means of grace, that is, the gathering of the saints and coming to hear the Word declared in the public fashion as God has prescribed. You would find that to be common among many that have difficult experiences in going on with the Lord. There are other factors. There are other issues. Perhaps it's not so much what you've left off as it is what has come in. And sometimes that's the case. That as you trace back and you say, you know, you know, preacher, if I'm honest with you tonight, there was times that were sweeter with the Lord. And if I was to ask you, well, what happened? What's made the difference? You would say, well, you know, I think if I really thought about it hard enough, it would be this matter or that matter or the other. Sometimes it's career, the busyness of life. Sometimes it's a hobby or some little thing that comes in. Someone mentions some program that they start watching on Netflix and you start watching it. and You never really got into a series before, but, but now you're immersed in it. And hours are wasted every evening and binging on all the garbage of the day. And you wonder why, why you're not enjoying the sweet fellowship that you once enjoyed. Common things, really. Common things that get in there and sever our enjoyment of the Lord. And if that is the case for you tonight, if you are not where you once were, you should not be content to stay where you are. You remember that passage in Elisha's life? And you have that man and he's, they're chopping down the tree and the axe head falls off and falls into the water. And he comes along and he's like, you know, he can't continue on the work because he's no axe head. There's no point in trying to cut down the tree with the shaft of the axe. He needs the head. And the question is asked, where fell it? Where fell it? And he knows exactly where it fell. He's able to point exactly where it is. And of course, on that occasion, Elisha causes, it says the iron did swim. The iron came and floated to the top and he picked it up and he could carry on. But the same is true concerning your life sometimes. Where fell it? Where did I fall? Where did I go back? What came into my life and hindered? And if I was to ask you that question, you would say, you know, I could point right to it. There, that thing, that time, that event. And you need to get it back up again and get a hold of it and go on with the Lord. This vile world is no friend of grace to help us on to God. And when we come to the passage we're looking at this evening, the, the remaining verses of Song of Solomon chapter 2, you can see this and it will come forth as we meditate on these verses. The bride, of course, is recording what her beloved had said to her on a previous occasion. You see that in verse 10. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And all the verses, we've already looked at them a month ago, these verses uh, from verse 8 down to verse 13. But you see how she's recording what he has said in the past, how she is putting on record what he said, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away, for lo, winter is past, and so on. Right down to the end of verse 13, where he repeats that same uh, word to her, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And that was a word to her. And it's good to be able to remember what the Lord has said to us, especially when he comes to encourage us to go on with himself, where he comes and she's able to, re to remember what the Lord has said. And you need to do that as well in your Christian life. Well, it carries on in verse 14 through 17. And as we look at these verses, we're considering them under the title, Maintaining Fellowship with Christ. 
maintaining fellowship with Christ, because I think that's really the essence of what is conveyed in these verses. I want you to note with me, first of all, a call, a call that comes forth really at the heart of verse 14. Let's read verse 14. O my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. As you look at that verse, you can see that what precedes the, the, the call is really just saying something that's true about her, O oh, my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock and the secret places of the stairs. But the real heart of why he is speaking, why he is communicating, is in these words, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice. That's the call. The groom is calling the bride into fellowship into communion. And this is what Christ says to his people. This is a word that he communicates to his church. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. Now, if we understand who we are by nature, then we have to ask the question, how is this possible? How is it possible that we should see his countenance and hear his voice? That he would beckon us into that place. How is it possible? I ask that because I know what the Scripture says about human nature, the sinfulness of man and the holiness of God. And there's such, there's such a divide between God and man. How is it possible that he could ever beckon the sinner and encourage the sinner to come near to him that he might see their countenance and hear their voice? Right from the earliest chapters of Genesis, you see this problem arise. In Genesis chapter 4, you remember what God said to Cain. You will know the story of Cain and Abel, I am sure. They come to worship the Lord. And it tells us that they brought their offerings. That's the word that's used, brought. That's the, the verb. So in bringing, there is implied there a place where you bring something. You mean you can't bring something without kind of going, be going somewhere. You have to kind of have a destination of where you're bringing something to. And so they had been taught, these boys had been taught by their father, by Adam, that they have to worship the true and living God. And he had taught them how to worship and upon what basis they worship. Because whenever Adam had sinned, you will know what the Lord did, that they tried to hide themselves and made, sewed fig leaves together. And God said, this will not do. This is the work of man's hands. And he slew an animal and he put those skins upon them as a sign that, by, that, that the blood must be shed for a covering. And then there was that symboling of the covering by the skins that they wore. Well, Adam got this. He understood this. And he communicates to his boys, this is how we worship God. And there was a place where they worshipped. A place appointed, a place where Adam said, here's where we worship God. And one day the boys come along and they worship. Of course, Abel obeys his dad. He listens to the word of God. He, he follows the, the instruction, as it were, and he, he brings of the flock, as it were. Blood is shed. Whereas Cain, he decides to bring the fruit of the ground. And he is rejected. Now, I'm just kind of reminding you of that scene. And God, of course, rejects his offering. And Cain, he turns aside. Instead of humbling himself, he will not humble himself. And then he takes it out in his brother, and he kills his own brother. Now, when we come to verses 13 and 14 of Genesis 4, we read these words, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And there you have an early reference to the struggle, the difficulty, we might say the impossibility of man being before the face of God. Cain's sin, Cain's rebellion evidenced this fact that he was not the Lord's. And in his sin, he is banished from the Lord. And he says, and from thy face shall I be hid. I will have no access before God. And that is the condition of men by nature. They have no grounds to come before God's face. If you're here tonight and you think that by religious activity, deeds, the work of your own hands, or the hands of any other man or other than the God-man, you are deluded. You can't please God. You can't come before His face. You have no access at all. You know better than Cain. If you're not born of the Spirit of God, you are as Cain was. 
And I trust that you're sensible to this condition and you realize it, because it's a sad thing to be deluded. On the contrary, of course, you have the occasion in Genesis in the life of Jacob when he met with the angel of the Lord in Genesis chapter 32. And some of you will be familiar with that scene as well, where he wrestled with that angel until the breaking of the day. And on that occasion, as he wrestles with them, and he's, he's struggling, and I will not let thee go except thou bless me, and so on, we see recorded in verse 30 of Genesis 32, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, I believe there Jacob was converted. God came and wrestled with him, and Jacob experienced genuine salvation. And in that saving experience, God comes in this prefiguring of the God-man. It's a foreshadowing of the fact that God would become man. And here in this angel of the Lord, it's not just some angel, some mere being of the heavenlies. As he wrestles, he becomes aware that this is not some mere creature or person or being that is somehow... Uh, just like me or, or, or even some of the hosts of heaven, he realizes he's wrestling with God himself. He says, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, as he wrestled there, again, that's a picture of, of, of as, as an experience of, of Christ coming to the hearts of men. And because Christ is wrestling with Jacob, he is preserved. His life is preserved. Christ mediates mercy to the sinner so that instead of being burnt up before the face of God, their life is preserved. Jacob's surprised. He's surprised that he is not cut off. But this is his first real experience of saving grace, and it allows him to see God's face. This is what Christians enjoy. In Christ, we are able to see God, not in the physical, not in the sense, for no man has seen God at any time in that sense. But what we visual, what we see, what we, when we use that term see, what we know, what we understand about God is what we see in Jesus Christ. And we come to God through Him. We experience fellowship because of him and because of the life that he lived, the death that he died, and his triumph over death, we are able to come and commune with God. If there is no Christ, we dealt with it in Bible class. We were looking at of Christ the mediator, chapter 8 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and I was saying that this, everything hinges on this fact. And we we're just dealing with this whole subject of the, of the mediator. If there is no mediator, there is no salvation. There is no hope, none whatsoever. But because there is a mediator, it's not just that there is some faint hope, there is tremendous hope. And for those in Christ, there is this call that come, comes to them. The Lord's able to say to his church, look at it, verse 14, let me see thy countenance. Is this not what he did with Jacob? Let me see thy countenance, Jacob. Let me hear thy voice. The Lord delighted in that, that desire of Jacob's heart that I will not let thee go except thou bless me. The Lord delighted in that. And because of his union with God and Christ, as it were, because of his salvation in the Son of God, and this that we all enjoy if we are saved here tonight, it may be said to any one of us, this call, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice. What a wonderful blessing. Now, Again, there are a few things around it that help illuminate all of this. She receives this call because of her protection. She receives this call because of her protection, because it says that, O oh my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the clefts of the rock, has this idea of refuge, of hiding in the cliffs, of hiding in a place where we are away from, of da from danger and anything that might take away our lives. And the psalmist speaks much in language like this. I'm not going to rehearse all the verses. There, there are many. But just for one example, Psalm 18, verse 2, David says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. And, and, and it goes on. And the language is just this idea of refuge, of refuge. And that's what's conveyed here, that she is in the cleft of the rock. She's hiding in a place of refuge. You may also remember Moses 
In Exodus chapter 33, when he prayed that prayer, show me thy glory, remember that? He wanted to see something of the glory of God. And so it is told to him in verse 22 of Exodus 33, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. I'll hide you in there, in the cleft of the rock. It's a place of refuge. It's a place where you're hidden and you're preserved and you're protected. And this is where she is. And this is where the church is, beloved. The church is in a place of protection. That which would often cause us to fear the fact that God is so infinitely holy and we have no right of approach unto him, we need not fear because we are in the clefts of the rock. You see, all of that, even Moses, when he hides in the cleft of the rock, I think that that was that, that, that same rock. I mean, I can't prove it, but it very well may be the same rock that followed them through the wilderness, of whom Paul later would write and say, that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. That rock that gave provision of water. That rock was Christ. Paul says that. And Moses hides in Christ. So what? So he can see God. He hides in Christ. And unless we're hidden in Christ, we will never see God. We'll never know God. And this is the position she enjoys. This is the protection she has. She's in the clefts of the rock. Thank God we're in the clefts of the rock. We're in Christ tonight. But she receives this call because of her position, not only her protection, but her position, because she's in the secret places of the stairs. You see that as well? In the secret places of the stairs. Stairs speak of elevation. They speak of height. And the Word of God is clear that the Christian now stands in a place of elevation. The doctrine of our union with Christ is of immense encouragement. And I emphasize it regularly because you need to be reminded of it, that you're in union with Christ. And so when you read the Scriptures, you see language that's true of the believer, that we died in Him. That's the amazing thing. When Jesus dies on the cross at Calvary, we die there in Him. And then when he rises again, Paul's very clear in the book of Romans that we rise in him. And as he ascends, we ascend with him. And so when he writes in Ephesians chapter 2, what does he say? Verses 4 and 6, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And th this is full. It's that, that passage is permeated with union. He raised us up together. It's not that he rose up and then I rose up later on. I rose up in him. When he rises, he is rising with, with the fact he's already in union with his people in a certain sense. Now, it has to come into a, a living experience in time for each one of us. But there's a sense in which I'm already in him when he dies, when he rises again. And he says, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That where Christ is seated in heaven, I am there. <laughs> I am there. You say, you're not there, you're here. You're standing in a pulpit in Calgary. Yes, I'm, I'm here, in flesh and blood, I'm here. But I'm as much in heaven with Christ now as I was, or am, or whatever was, I may say, in Christ when he died. And that's what Scripture makes abundantly plain. By our union with Christ, you say, I don't, I struggle to understand that. Study it. Study it. Study the language of the apostle particularly. Study the sense that he uses continually that we are in him, in whom, in Christ, so on, repeatedly, over and over and over again. He is, he is pummeling God's people with this reality that God's people are in union with Christ at every level, at every level. And this brings tremendous joy. We are in, look at it, the secret places of the stairs. The secret places. No man has a right to be in heaven. None. It's like a secret place to man. He can never get there. Never. No man could ever work his way to heaven. He, can, he will never attain it. He will never get there. But where's the believer? Where's the believer? He is there. He's there. In Christ, he's already there together with him in heavenly places. That Christ, through his life and death and resurrection and our union with him, that we are brought, seated together with him in a secret place where no man can be except through his merit and his work. And so we are elevated to this. 
Oh, you, you may not attain the, the position you like in life, the promotions you seek for, the money you desire, whatever he's, your hearts are inclined towards, but you literally could not ask for more than what has prov been provided for you in Christ. You couldn't ask for more. Is this not what Paul comes to understand, or at least to convey to us in Romans chapter 8? That since God has given us his Son, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? And that's the case, that Christ is just a fountainhead of blessing to his people. So we're in the secret places of the stairs. Are you there? Are you there? Are you with Christ in heavenly places? Are you? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you meditate upon a Christian? Do you realize where you are? I know you say, well, I'm here on the earth and I'm struggling to make ends meet and I'm dealing with this issue and that issue. It doesn't really feel like I'm in heaven right now. No, you're not physically there, but you are in Christ who is there. There are numberless blessings that I think are hidden from all of our views because of what we have in Christ. And so Christ can commune. This is really the, the heart of it. When I ask the question, how can we ever come to have such an invitation like this, such a call as this, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice. It's because of our union in Christ. We are in the clefts of the rock, we're in Christ there. We're in the secret places of the stairs. And so he says, because you're there, in essence, we might say, because you're in me, because you're in me, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Does the Lord hear your voice? Does he see your face? Maybe you believe that lie. You say to yourself, I can't pray right now. There's sin in my life right now, and I, I know I can't pray. Let me let you in on something. There's always sin in your life, always. Now, I'm not, I'm not passing over gross sin, deliberate rebellion. I'm not saying that's a light thing. I'm not. But at the same time, at the same time, as you grow in holiness, you will grow in your understanding of the depth of depravity of your heart. You know, when you come to Christ and you get saved, you're like, there's this big thing in your life and you have to deal with that. I mean, this is the problem some people have. You say, I can't come to Christ because of this sin in my life. And you tell them, look, Christ will deal with that sin. He doesn't say, clean up your life and then come. He says, come and I'll clean up your life. He gives the power to change. He gives that new heart, new affections, new desires that you no longer want to do that thing. But at the same time, that huge sin in your life that you think is such a hindrance, <laughs> and then you overcome that. What you're going to find as you grow in holiness is that those sins that grieve your heart seem to multiply because you begin to see sin for all of its grossness and vileness and heinousness. You begin to see that, I can't believe I, I thought even that thought. I can't believe I uttered that word, that, that the way I uttered that to my wife, that there was a sharpness in my tongue. God forgive me. Or the way you deal with your employer, you enter into gossip about him with everyone else. And then you realize something you maybe did for years, giving grief behind the back of your boss. And then one day the light of God's truth gets into your heart and you realize that's an awful crime against God. And so more and more sin becomes illuminated in you and rather than feeling that you are being, you are gaining ground in holy living, you actually sometimes feel worse. And you read the biographies of, of men who have walked with God, who have known intimate fellowship with the Lord. And all the records of these men and, and everything that was known by them, and even their own record of their lives sometimes where they, where they convey certain things. You see, oh, how holy they were. And yet, how, how unholy they felt to themselves. 
So it is only in Christ that you can come. It's only in Christ you can say, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice. You can never come and say, yes, I have a right to come and him see me and hear from me. My voice is sweet. I understand my voice is sweet. I, my voice is sweet. No, it's not. Your voice is only sweet as it comes through Christ. And your appearance is only comely because you stand in union with Christ. Never forget it. So you say, I'm struggling with sin right now. You need to be on your knees before the Lord praying. He needs to hear your voice. He needs to see your face. In fact, he's calling it out. He's saying, is he still not saying to you tonight, let me see your countenance again, Christian? Let me hear your voice again. The amazing thing is that it is sweet to him. But this is all because of him, all that he has done. And she receives this call because of her purity. I can't spend too much time on this, but you see how he begins? Oh, my dove, oh, my dove. The Bible can makes it very plain that a dove depicts purity. And that's why they were used in the sacrificial system. The only birds that are used, the, the dove and the, the turtle dove, the pigeon, there's only birds used in the sacrificial system. That's also why the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down upon him, Luke tells us, in the form of a dove, showing that he was, that other men had been filled with the Spirit of God, other men, the Holy Spirit had come upon them, but never in the form of a dove. And so because of his purity, and the purity of the Holy Spirit could come and fill his life, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit without measure, we're told. So the dove is a symbol of purity, and she is addressed in this way, Oh, my dove. The Christian, you see, is to have dove-like qualities. Why? Because they're to have the indwelling spirit. That pure Spirit is in the heart of the believer. And it is therefore to manifest purity. Now, purity in a number of ways. First, purity in relation to the world. Purity in relation to the world. We are meant to be different. I know it's not popular, but the Word of God is plain. What, is, what does Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3? This is the will of God. Now, again, young people, when I was over with Reverend Golliker, he wanted me to address the young people on Saturday evening just for a short time. And one of the questions they asked there was about the will of God. How can we know the will of God? And that question was put to them, and they, would, they answered and did very well with that. And then I, I kind of added some things to that because this, this, I asked them the question, do you ever struggle with the will of God? And of course they were like, yes, all the time, every day, struggling with the will of God. Young people, almost almost universally in the church struggle with the will of God. What is the will of God for my life? And I can't give you an answer. I can't give you an answer in regard to your education, what direction you should take, or your employment, or your relationship. I can't give hard and fast rules for all of you and say this is the person for you, and this is the job for you, and this is the course you should take. I can't make that claim. I don't know what God's will is in that prophetic sense. But this is what I do understand. If young people and older people, but if young people particularly struggling with the will of God would get what Paul says, this is the will of God. This is the will of God. What is it, Paul? Even your sanctification. This is the will of God. Your holiness. That's what sanctification is. You being set apart. This is the will of God, your holiness. And he goes on to say that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. And so there's purity in relation to the world. We are not to be like the world. If you're a Christian here and you engage in the same sins to the same degree that the world engages in, there's something wrong. The Lord calls out to his church, Oh, my dove. Where are the dove-like qualities? Where are the dove-like qualities? There's also purity in relation to its witness, the church's witness, the bride's witness. What is her witness to be like? Well, the Lord Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, 16, Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. <laughs> this is our conduct in the world, to be wise as serpents and harmless as 
as doves. Imagine God's people were more like this. Imagine we all had more dove-like qualities. That we were harmless as doves in the view of the unsaved. We would have far less of this. There's no way I would ever become a Christian. I, I, I knew a man who used to go to the church, and, and he did this and that and the other. Or people, as they say today, I wouldn't go near the church. You see, you know, scandal after scandal in the news. One pastor involved in this kind of immorality. Another pastor involved in some sort of financial scandal. This is it's happening all the time. And what are they doing? They're not living like doves. They're causing harm to the witness of the church. But the same goes for the way you conduct your affairs before the world. Are you as harmless as a dove? Or do you give reason for them to excuse themselves from their spiritual responsibilities? Imagine we were all as harmless as doves in the church. That we didn't cause any harm to one another. That we were, we were careful, we were careful not to harm another brother or sister. Imagine we were harmless to our families, harmless as doves. And as husbands, we would not speak sharply and excuse it when we address our wives. Harmless as doves. Oh, how many, how many women have been made bitter, bitter in their marriages because of a, a husband's carelessness and hardness, lack of understanding, lack of love and compassion, causing harm, causing harm to children as well, especially fathers. Fathers have, have this tendency, and they, in their dealing with their children, they have a tendency to, to actually discourage their children. This is why Paul explicitly says to fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't anger them. Don't upset them. Stop provoking them. They cause harm. Fathers cause harm. Of course, mothers can cause harm in ways as well. Their lack of submission, love, and tenderness to their husband. Oh, imagine... Imagine we were harmless as doves. But we should be. Oh, my dove that art in the clefts of the rock and the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice and thy countenance is comely. So there's a call here. Let us also see a caution. Verse 15. Let's move on to verse 15. It says, take us the foxes the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. The caution presented here is to ensure that the grapes do not get damaged, do not, do not get spoiled, that there can be a spoiling of the vines, and those vines have tender grapes. Now, when you read the Word of God, you will discover in a number of places that Israel is uh, depicted as a vine. A number of passages that deal with that. Psalm 80, Isaiah chapter 5. There's a chapter in Ezekiel as well, I think, that deals with this. And so Israel's depicted like a vine. Now, here we are told that the vine should not be spoiled. The fruit of the vine should not be spoiled. It shouldn't be destroyed or corrupted. And so this desire to preserve the fruit is intimated in the language. It's a caution, therefore. It's a caution. Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines for our vines of tender grapes. Now, what are the foxes? That's the question. <laughs> what are they relating to here? Obviously, it's the animal. We know what a fox is, and they can come and they can they spoil the fruit of these vines. And, and, and foxes are destructive. I mean, that's in their nature. I mean, I know I, I'm a townie. Most of you are city slickers. Don't know too much about the countryside. But if you ever try to keep hens, one of the things you will need to try and keep out are foxes or things of that nature. And you, go, you, you will hear about it. Anyone who keep, keeps hens, they, they, they will know the fear of a fox coming in because a fox will get in. If there's any chance, any way in at all, 
They will get in. I mean, they tell you to put the fencing at least a foot down into the ground to try and keep the fox from digging under and make sure it's high enough, at least six foot tall, because if it's five foot, it could even scale over it. So you have to be careful. And then what they will do is they will go in and they will kill every hen and walk out with one. Destroy everything. Foxes have this destructive nature. Now, in Scripture, we ask ourselves, well, in what way can we understand exactly what the foxes depict? Well, in one way, we can think of evil men being likened to a fox and their corrupting influence upon the church. Jesus says in Luke chapter 13 about Herod being that old fox. And Herod had fox-like qualities. In other words, he was destructive. He had absolutely no sympathy toward the church whatsoever, toward God's people. And evil men are like foxes. They're destructive, they're evil, they're corrupting in their influences. And you look out into the world today, you will find many foxes, many. People who try to destroy the church. But I'm not going to get sidetracked into that. I think these foxes are really more those other tiny little things because the, the little foxes, these little foxes, in other words, there's at times it's so easy not to discern their entrance. These little foxes are the things that come in and cause a problem in the fruitfulness of our living. They destroy our fruit bearing. They prevent us from bearing fruit. Now, it may be external circumstances like evil men, but I th- usually it's going to be something in our life. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1, very interesting. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 1, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So you have this, this, this little ointment in a bottle and flies get in, and those tiny little flies, I mean, you'd hardly know they even were in the ointment in the first place, but they spoil it. And before you realize, when you begin to smell the, 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 there's something putrid, something wrong with the ointment, it doesn't smell the way it ought to smell. And then you look and you examine and you realize afterwards, little flies have gotten in. He goes on and likens this to the life of a man because he says, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly that is so doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. And what Solomon has observed in his life is this. You can have a man who has been honorable and wise and careful through his whole life. He is known as a man of God, let's say. He has walked with the Lord for years. He is a man of influence, a man of character. Someone people look up to, someone people go to for advice. And a little fly that spoils the ointment, a little folly destroys his reputation. A little folly. It doesn't take some great big thing, just a little folly. And Solomon uses the same term here, little, except it's foxes. These little foxes that spoil the vines. Little things, little folly, a little folly. That's what the foxes are. They're little bits of folly that we allow into our lives. Sin that we allow into our lives and they spoil the vines. They spoil the fruitfulness of our living. Now you know this to be true. You know it. The grapes, the fruitfulness of the Christian is a tender thing. It is not easy to continually bear fruit to the Lord. It's a constant struggle. And the biggest struggle we have, the biggest struggle we contend with, is the inner battle, the inner man, the dying to self, the dying to sin, the putting away the old man with his deeds, the mortification of the flesh. This is the ongoing battle. And there are these little foxes that come into your life, and they're they're little. They're little. They're little because, for the most part, you don't see them. At least... There's a sense in which very often they can creep in undetected. Christians fall into this trap. They, they, they learn holiness, they learn godly activity or ungodly activity from others. Christians justify a change in their behavior all the time by what they see in other Christians. 
The Lord, I've, I've seen this so many times, the Lord will deal with some young man or some young woman. He comes to Christ, she comes to Christ, and the Lord begins to put his finger on matters in their life. And he's putting things away, and they're wanting to walk with the Lord, and they're going on well, and the Lord's saying, that there, that, that, that needs to go. That's not helping you. And they're like, okay, Lord, and they put, they put it away. Years pass, and they come across other Christians, people they love or spend time with, and they realize, well, they do this. They do this. So what's the big deal? And they begin to justify it. And they, and, and they know there, there's a point in their mind, there's a point in their heart where, where they know, because the Lord always creates a way of escape, they know it's not for them. But they silence it. It's like they turn a blind eye to the little fox. They let it in. It happens all the time. All the time. It's different things. Someone puts away the worldly music. Not listening to worldly music anymore. And then they, then they know these other Christians and they're listening to worldly music. And they go into their cars and the, the, you know, the radio that's on is playing ungodly music. And they think, well, you know, maybe it's not a big deal. And they start to do it. Or other matters. God has put his finger on things as, as they grew, as they were growing. And then they let this little fox come back in. They think they can get away with it, but you know what it does? It destroys your fruitfulness. For our vines have tender grapes. Christian, do not take for granted a sensitivity to sin and grieving the Spirit of God. There should be a mindset, Lord, make me sensitive. One fox will destroy the entire vine. I just read a quote by Spurgeon. I wonder if I can recall it. No great sin can destroy the Christian, but a small sin can make him miserable. And it's true. It's very true. It's just one little fox, one little step backwards in sanctification, one little step removed from the desire to walk with the Lord, and you let something in. Everyone else is doing it. You have no idea how many times. When we got married, we got married, and we asked ourselves a question. I said to Melanie, I said, do we want a television? And we both looked at each other and said, well, we're busy most nights of the week. And what would we do with it anyway? And we decided, no. So we didn't want to put that on the wedding list. We didn't want to buy it when we got married. There was, there was no TV. I'm not saying that, you know, with a TV or sans TV, it makes you more godly or whatever, but that was a decision we came to. And you would go on. We went to Australia, and in the, the home there, there was a TV. And sure enough, with it there, we watched it. And we come back, we come back to Northern Ireland and as you know, do we want do we want a TV? Because well we watched it when we were there, and we were like, No, no, we don't. We don't want that in our life. Like well, and we made a decision and it was a good decision. It was a healthy decision. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I thought it was a good decision then. Then children come along, and all of a sudden it becomes an even better decision. I'm amazed. I am amazed. At, at the difference that it makes either when the children are sitting in front of a TV or not. We would go on vacation, head up to, even for a few days, up to the mountains. We've done that a few times, go up for two or three nights and spend some time. Then there's a TV in the room. That's fine. You give a little bit of leeway with the children. They sit and watch something. And they watch it and they, and they watch for so long. And then their mood changes. Their mood actually changes. They become cranky. They become demanding. They become uh, impatient. And, and you see the core. They, they are never like this. Sitting here in front of this thing actually has affected their mental reasoning and their very character and behavior. Remember one time they were watching one particular program. It's massive in the UK. Peppa Pig. I don't know if it's as big here. But... I was watching, and I heard, I heard this, 
this, uh, her, I think it was her, Peppa's little brother, George, he throws a tantrum in the middle of the program and he starts on the floor slamming you know, his, feet, his, his hands on the ground and kicking and screaming because he didn't get what he wanted. And I was like, that is it. It is off. And you're never watching Peppa Pig again. This is learned behavior. That when you don't get what you want, that this is the response. You're going to like kick and scream and lie on the floor. And then I, then I know why, because uh, I've seen it. I was standing, I was doing outreach one day, in fact. And we were standing at the train station and this, this young couple came along and the little child came along as well. And it just threw itself to the ground in the middle of like Sunridge there by, by the bus station or by the bus stop. And it just threw himself on the ground and starts kicking and screaming. Of course, the father, he walked on. It was like, as if it's not mine, but it was. But he, walked, he didn't want anything to do with it. And the poor mother, she's trying to pick this child up. And he's kicking and screaming. And I just want, I wanted to go and grab him and say, you, you intervene. Deal with that child. Don't let it behave like that. But it's learned behavior. And the times you, you kind of think about temptation to go and get a bit nice to relax sometimes in front of a nice big TV and watch something and chill out, as it were. And then you say, no, no, that's letting in a little fox. Destroys your fruitfulness. It's so subtle. It's so subtle. Just tiny little things. They creep in and you justify it. Oh, it's not really a big deal. but it spoils your fruitfulness for God. So there's a caution. But you know what the encouragement is just before we move on in verse 15? The Lord says, take us the foxes. Now, my time is running away, so I can't elaborate on this too much, but let's just suffice with this point. The Lord is not saying, take you the little foxes. He's saying, take us. In other words, in the process of sanctification, in godly living, we are not living and trying to be godly on our own. The Lord helps. The Lord gives grace. Christ comes in to the Christian. He uses the word. You sit here in meetings like this and he, he begins to speak to your heart. And what's he saying to you? He's not saying you figure out your own way to deal with those matters in your life or put away sin and go on and live godly. He is coming along. He's saying, take us. Come on, I'll help you. I'm there. I'll give you the grace. I'll give you the power. Is it not the Lord that illuminates our minds to even see the little foxes? Is it not? I mean, the world out there, they live on absolutely, completely oblivious. I remember just talking, because it's relevant to what we just said, television. My mother invited this young girl that she worked with into our home. She came down to visit. I'd never met this young woman before. But my mom had a heart for her, trying to reach her for the Lord. And she was coming to see us and she said, come with me, sure. So this young woman came along, came into our home, and she sat down in our living room. This is over in Northern Ireland. And she sat there, and <laughs> you could see the, the bewilderment in her face. She sat there, she was not sitting there any, any time at all, and she sat and she looked around and she was, where's your TV? <laughs> and we were like, we don't have a TV. She was like, you don't, have a t you don't have a TV. I was like, she'd never met anyone. He didn't have a TV. I just, I'll never forget this, the look on her face as she sat. Because, of course, our, our sofas, our seat, they're, all, they're all spaced so that you look at each other, right? So you have a sofa here and a sofa here and whatever, and we're all looking at each other. Not all pointed at some device in the corner. It's a wonderful difference what it makes in the communication of a family when you're sitting on seats and looking at each other rather than looking at some stupid thing stuck in the corner. But, I mean, she'd never thought about it whatsoever. The world, the world wouldn't even consider these things. Wouldn't even come into their mind. But, but, but the Lord says, take us, the little foxes. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm making you aware. Take us, the foxes. You can consider that and rejoice in the fact that the gospel does not leave you on your own to live a holy life. The Lord is with you. There's also a confession here, verse 16. He has... He's no longer speaking. The bride is speaking of the bridegroom now. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Here's a confession. 
She is rehearsing what he means to her and what she means to him. And she confesses him. She's like publicly saying, my beloved is mine and I am his. She's delighting in her union. She's not shy about it. And we shouldn't be shy about it either. We should tell people that you love the Lord Jesus, that you walk with him. And there's two ways in which you see this here. Again, I can't elaborate on it, but in this union, the way she words it, my beloved is mine and I am his, you see Christ in us and we being in Christ. Because scripture talks in terms like that, that, that Christ is in us and we are in Christ. Both those things are made clear in Scripture. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. What Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, Christ in you, Christ in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you have this, and this is, my beloved is mine. Christ is in me, he is in me, but also I am his. In other words, I am in Christ. And Paul speaks that way as well. We quote at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You hear the words of the Lord Jesus in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, we are in him. We are in him, he that abideth in me. And so she's delighting in the union. My beloved is mine and I am his. My beloved is mine, and I am his. I am in him, and he is in me. And this is the Christian's joy. None will ever pluck us out of his hand. Never. And then she says, he feedeth among the lilies. He feedeth among the lilies. Now, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, you'll see how lilies are depicted. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns. And we dealt with these first two verses. We saw Christ as the lily. And we see the church as the lily, the lily among thorns, there's the church. And now we're being told, she says, he feedeth among the lilies. That is, Christ feeds among his church. He is in his church. And this is a tremendous thought that I have no time to develop, but you just think about this. So what she is saying is, he feeds among the lilies. He comes to feed in his church. He comes to his church in order to enjoy something of her. He does. There are many passages that express this. The one that most evidently comes to mind is whenever the Lord says, where, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. So the lilies are there. There's the two or three. They, they, they are there. They gather together in his name. They gather there to meet with one another. The beloved, the, the brethren, the sisters, they come, two or three, gathered in the Savior's name. Just a small number even. Even just the tiniest number, just two or three, they assemble there. And I know the context of Matthew 18. I understand that. But there's certainly application to the church in general. And they're meeting together. And they come, even two or three. And what does Jesus say? I want to be there. I want to be there. I want to feed among the lilies. I want to be where the church is. He feeds among the lilies. In other words, the Lord delights in the lilies. He comes to be amongst the lilies. There's two or three meeting in my name. I'm going to be there. Oh, you see, Tuesday night comes around. The prayer meeting comes around. You might not be there, but Jesus is. Every time. Every time. He sees his people gather in his name. He's the first there. He's the first there. They are my people. They're gathering. They're coming to assemble. I'll be there. Oh, the Lord always has an appointment with his people where they gather in his name. He loves to feed among the lilies. He loves to hear the voice. Is that not what he's saying? Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. Oh, it's so sweet to hear your voice, church. I want to be there when you're calling on my name. You see the delight of the Lord in this church? You see the love expressed in this language? You see the encouragement that it is that we do not worship some Christ who's distant from his people who kind of stand offish and doesn't really want to relate with them or connect with them. You see, that's the way most kings and sovereigns and leaders are, aren't they? They don't really want to be amongst the riffraff of the citizens. But not the Lord. Not the Lord. This man receiveth sinners and eats with them. He eats with them. I mean, that was the accusation the Pharisees brought. Oh, look at him. 
He receives sinners and eats with them. Look at this character. And then he went on to tell a parable and says, I'm going to show you just how much I do that. I'm going to tell you about the one sheep. When the 99 are there, the one that's lost. Yes! I go after the lily. And I'm going to tell you about my love for all of my people so that I will gather them in one by one because I feed among the lilies. And so finally, verse 17, until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. This verse is enveloped in a prayer. The heart of it is, turn, my beloved. That's her desire. Turn, my beloved. What comes before and comes after hinges on this desire, this prayer, this concern of her heart. Turn, my beloved. And she prays it at a time of night until the day break and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved. You see, the church, as she lives in this world, lives in a time of night in the darkness of a world in sin. Now, there are some times when the Lord conveys in his word that, that the opposite of that, really, that his work was going to end at night. When he said in John 9, verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, he uses that, and that's fine. But the opposite is conveyed by Paul. When he says in Romans 13, verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. And he is talking there about our time of sojourning and laboring. This night in which we live is coming to an end. And we will draw into the eternal day of heaven itself. And so that's really what's reflected here by her. She's saying, turn my beloved in the midst of this night in which she lives. And the church lives in, a, in the midst of the, of the night of this world. The darkness of sin and depravity and rebellion and hatred. A government that despises the church. A church herself which is polluting herself and destroying herself. And There's just much darkness, much discouragement as evil men and seducers wax worse and worse. But in the midst of this night, there's this cry from the church. Turn, my beloved. In other words, in the midst of the darkness of life, in the midnight of life, in the difficulties of life, her prayer is, turn, Lord. Turn. Now, you can trace that prayer through the Scriptures. You can think of Psalms, where the psalmist says this. Turn us, O Lord of hosts. And then the other language that refers to, turn, Lord, and cause thy face to shine upon us. Let us see your countenance. And they want to see the Lord. That's the prayer. Really, that's the desire. It's like the Greeks came and said to Philip, we would see Jesus. It's the same kind of prayer. Turn, my beloved, I want to see you. And be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains. of be there. Be there speaks of separation, of division. And so we live in a world which brings much division and separation. Many obstacles to our walking with the Lord, our fellowship with Christ. You know those obstacles. We've dealt with some of them already. These little foxes, these things that come in, these matters that, that we struggle with as we remain imperfect in this world. But her prayer is, turn my beloved. And be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. You Remember what we dealt with there in verse 8? Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. These obstacles are nothing to the Lord as he makes his way to his people, to his church. They're nothing. Obstacles are nothing to him. And so she's saying, Be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. These huge mountains of separation, they're nothing to those roes and young hearts. And so she is desirous that he will come to her again. Turn, my beloved, in the midst of the darkness of this life, come. Come and reveal yourself to me. This is a wonderful prayer. A wonderful prayer. And I wonder, do you know anything about it? Do you know anything about the Lord turning to you? She does not need to doubt that she can pray this. The church does not need to fear that she can ask, turn my beloved. There may be darkness all around, but she knows she can come and say, turn, turn to me. And his, 
his dealings with her have taught her this. As we began in verse 14, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice and thy countenance is comely. We have all the encouragement that the Lord wants to draw near to us. That he, he rejoices in this. That he delights in this. That his desire is just to see you and to hear you. Some people in this world, they may not want to see you. Sometimes even your, your nearest and dearest <laughs> may get fed up listening to you at certain occasions. But the Lord never gets fed up. Never gets fed up seeing you. Never gets fed up hearing from you, ever. And in the midst of the darkness, we can cry, turn my beloved. Maybe for some here tonight, this darkness is that darkness of spiritual night, of separation from God, of a lack of spiritual life. And you want the day to break and the shadows to flee away. That's what you want. You want them all to flee away. There you are in the midst of a darkness, a spiritual darkness. You're trying to feel your way to life, perhaps. You want to make your way to the Lord. You want to be brought to a sense of assurance of faith. You want to know that you can say, like she said, my beloved is mine and I am his. There's no doubt in her, is there? None. She knows who she belongs to. She knows who belongs to her. My beloved is mine and I am his. She's able to say that, and the child of God has a right to be assured of it. These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. You have to know it. And so in the midst of the darkness, we can say, even spiritually, if you're here tonight and you're lacking assurance, you don't know where you stand, you say, turn, my beloved, turn, Lord Jesus, put away the shadows of this spiritual night. Take away the darkness that clouds my vision from seeing you in all of your glories and wonder. Turn it all away. Turn to me. Let me have, let me have what your people have, light. All the divisions, all the mountains of Beda, the mountains of separation, all of them, just deal with them, Lord. You know what they are in my life, but just turn, Lord Jesus, turn, Lord Jesus, to me. And he loves it. He loves that cry. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. That old rebel hanging upon the cross, dying, crimes, a life of crime. And yet still that cry, remember me. Remember me. Remember me. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Absolute assurance given to the sinner who turns to the Lord Jesus. Praise his name. Let us bow together in prayer.